praise God. I thought I was just going to start weeping like a little girl. I did. I, I did too, but I just kind of held it in some. All right. Well, let's get some lights on and some Bibles out, and we'll go to the Lord in the time of prayer. But I do need to make some announcements first, and I, I really hate putting announcements between uh, worship and the Word, but I need to do it today because we've got some needs that I need to represent for the uh, um, children's workers. Um, we have uh, a shortage of uh, women. We only allow right now female children's helpers. Um, and we have a shortage particularly on, on Sundays. And if there would be anyone here, we're actually a little short this morning, that would be willing to step out. You can go right around the hallway and just walk in and let them know you'd be willing to help. But for the future as well, we could use a, a couple more women that might, you know, take a Sunday once a month or something like that, that once we put you on a schedule, you can really stick to it and be a faithful servant in it. Um, I know that's not the most glorious part of ministry that people rush to sign up for, but if the Lord would put that on your heart, be obedient and respond to that. Amen? Um, and if there's any now just walk out and go around. Um, this would be the time when if there's still any elementary and we can bring them out too. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would teach us this morning. God, we thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we don't have to get together and do this alone, that you're faithful and where two or more gather in your name, you truly are present, Lord. I sense your spirit right now and I thank you for your presence. Hallelujah, Father. Praise your glorious name. Mighty God, we worship you this morning. And we pray that you would teach us. Open our eyes, God, we pray. Open our hearts. Help us to see the things that are freely given to us, Lord, by you. Help us to hear your voice this morning, Lord. Not to harden our hearts as you speak, Lord. But to embrace what you say, Lord God. Respond to your cry, your call to us. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 4, and we left off last week. We were looking basically at the cost of being a spirit-filled church. And, you know, you could say the cost of being a spirit-filled person, spirit-filled man or, or woman as well, and it, it'd really be no different. The cost is the same. And we looked through... Um, several passages to make the case um, as clear as we could, but the scripture here in Acts 3 and 4 is so clear, right after they're filled with the Spirit of God, serving a Savior who's been crucified and who's risen from the dead, immediately there's opposition from without, they're arrested, trouble arises, but the Spirit of God continues to fill them and overflow them with power to be his witnesses. And uh, we looked at other areas like Luke chapter 14 where Jesus says that we must count the cost if we're going to truly follow him and be a disciple. So we're going to kind of pick it up um, where we left off in Acts chapter 4. This is when after they had been released from jail with a warning to no longer speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus, uh, they gathered with their company, those who they worshipped with and were closest to in Jerusalem, and they began to pray. And we'll rejoin them in verse 31, when after they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So they had counted the cost. And if you would turn, leave a finger in Acts chapter 4, but turn to Luke 14. They had counted the cost and they had been filled with the Spirit. They were being filled with the Spirit over and over again. The power of God was on their lives. And here they are in their prayer time getting a reaction from heaven. Now, this is unusual to our experience. I mean, we 
have the wonderful experience, even this morning, of having the presence of God accompany our worship and accompany our, our prayers. But when they prayed, it wasn't as though there were some individually felt presence of the Lord. There was more than that. It says that the room was shaken. The room was shaken. There was an earthquake that you could have measured on the Richter scale inside of the room. And this isn't symbolic. It actually occurred. If it happened here, I think God is uh, miraculous enough to, you know, spare the building and things like that. I don't think stuff broke all over the house. But I think the room would be shaky. Seats would be out of place. You would... You know, stop and startle and look around, but accompanied by the presence of the Lord, quickly realize that the mighty Savior, Jesus Christ, had simply revealed Himself to have been in the midst of your prayer. And that's what happens here. And the experience is so encouraging that they're filled with boldness. And we need experiences from the Lord. And I'm not preaching that we need to run after experiences. But we need to have supernatural experiences in the presence of God because they're meant to encourage us. They're meant to excite us. They're, they're meant to fill us with boldness because after something like this takes place, they can go out and face opposition knowing that, man, they serve the kind of God that brings earthquakes into a room. You can sit in your living room and God could measure something on the Richter scale and your neighbor not even know it. That's the kind of God that He is. We need these kind of experiences. But they only had this because they had counted the cost. Is this too loud, by the way? Could I get away with turning it down or are you fine where we're at? We're okay? They had counted the cost. And see, here's the reality. You can't work this up. You can't work it up. You can't sit around and shout. You can't put out a bunch of flyers and tell people you're going to have some kind of revival. You can't invite all of the most coveted Christian speakers of your generation and expect God to show up. That is foolishness. Amen. These people have counted the cost. And we, so few of us do that. Luke chapter 14, I want to take a look at it. We talked about uh, the verses extending from about verse 25. We didn't go over them verse by verse and really do any kind of uh, exegesis on it, you know, tearing it apart and looking deeply into it. But we did talk about uh, around verses 25 through uh, about 30, the man who sets out to build a tower and doesn't have enough to finish, gets the foundation done, and then he's out of gas. But I want to look at uh, some other verses in Luke 14 following that story. Jesus has had multitudes of people around him. And he loves them, but he turns on the people and he says, you can't follow me unless you hate your mother, father, brother, sister, wives, and children. And that is meant to shock them and to open their ears and cause them to say, what? What do you mean, hate mom and dad and my wife and kids? Like, come on. It doesn't make any sense. And we talked about last week how what it has to do with is pledging the supreme love to Christ that is unchecked. Nothing compares to it. So much so that when someone who didn't know any better looked at the love you have for those that are closest to you and then saw it alongside of what you have pledged to Christ, it would appear to be hatred because this that you have pledged to Christ is so superior. Now, that call to count the cost and to really become a disciple of Christ is not an easy call. I mean, those are hard words. And I want you to look at uh, another of the little parabolic sayings that he gives us when he's talking about this in Luke chapter 14. It says, verse 31, Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first 
and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Meaning he's, he's outnumbered. Two to one. Verse 32, or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. I mean, that's just the reasonable, that's the sensible thing to do. You got 10,000 in your army, and your opponent has 20,000. And as best as you can tell, physically speaking, they've got swords and spears and bow and arrows, and that's what you got. It's not like that they've got, you know, a huge array of, you know, tanks, this army of 10,000. It's pretty uh, even lined up, except for the fact that this group over here they're facing has 10,000 more foot soldiers. So the reasonable thing to do is say, this is foolish, wave the white flag, we surrender, Let's come up with some kind of terms of peace. We'll pay you taxes or whatever, send you some bananas and oats in the mail, and, you know, don't beat us up. We're not going to face you. So likewise, Jesus will say, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, how does that connect with this whole idea of a king facing an army twice the size? The idea is this. What Jesus is actually asking you to sign up for, if you're going to follow him with all your hearts, is unreasonable. It's ridiculous. You can't even think to do what it is that he's asking you to do, not in your wildest dreams. And so based on logic alone, the only reasonable thing to do is wave the white flag and say, I can't do it. I, I just can't do that. I know what I got. I've counted the cost. It's not there. See ya. I'm going to go another direction. But what would it cause a king in this situation? To say, no, you know what? Yeah, we got 10,000. We're outnumbered. But I'm going to go and face them anyway. And we're going to conquer. We're going to win. Well, insanity could, could be something. You know, he's just like a kamikaze suicide bomber mentality. Or faith. Faith. Yeah. Faith. That there's something that though you can't see it with your eye, because it is 10,000 against 20,000, there's nothing we can see that would make it reasonable, make it make sense to go forward. But faith in what cannot be seen. Faith that God would be with him. And you see it all through the Old Testament. Gideon with his army that's whittled down to 300. All through the Old Testament, David, little bitty man, child, standing before Goliath, all the way through the Old Testament and into the New, you see it in Jesus. As He stands to face all of the armies of hell at the cross, takes on the entire world, and comes out victorious through death. God is always for the underdog. And God will often make you the underdog. He'll put you in a situation where you are being called to do something and you, you don't have what it takes. You don't have the natural talent. You don't have the money. You don't have the energy. It just isn't you. And yet God is calling you to that. And oftentimes, oftentimes that's how you know it's God. And it's funny because people in this generation tend to think, well, I know it's God because, you know, I've already been doing this all my life, and I'm really good at it. I can do it better than everybody else. And so, you know, obviously God would call me to do it, you know. I'm the best pick. And you look at the Scripture, no, no, no. God will raise personalities and invest strengths and talents into them to use them. But if they get that attitude, he always breaks them before that can ever happen. Most often, God chooses the weak, the despised, the powerless to accomplish things that people look at them and realize they could not accomplish. So in this scenario,
scenario we have before us in the book of Acts, that's what, that's what it is. It's Peter, it's this fisherman guy who showed himself to be a coward when he denied Jesus three times just seven weeks before this incident. And now he's preaching, he's healing, he's going to jail. But earthquakes are coming into the room when this guy prays now. When he and his entourage get together and pray, the room is being shaken. They're being filled with the Spirit. They're going out boldly. Something has changed. They counted the cost. Look at this last part. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dung hill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Salt is good unless it's lost its saltiness. If salt loses its saltiness, that's like Christian losing his Christ. There isn't anything Christ-like about him. He, he's a Christian. That's the title. We identify him that way. There's the fish on the back of the car and a t-shirt and church attendance. He's a Christian. But the saltiness, the Christ that makes him worth something is undetectable. And he says if this is the case with someone, it isn't fit for the land. You know, they would throw it down on the land and it would clear paths by killing vegetation. And then they would also use it as, you know, preservatives with their food and, and things like that as well. It had many uses. But what's more interesting, he says, it's not even fit for the dung hill. That, you know what that means? The dung hill, do you know what that is? That's like a compost pile. Some of you, if you've done gardening, you know what? It's just rotted stuff. A compost pile. You could throw your dead fish and your old raked up leaves and bark and trash and sticks and banana peels or whatever. A compost pile, right? Not even fit for the compost pile. You know why? You're not even capable of rotting. Not even capable of rotting. He, he can't even decompose. There's no capability of even dying. What he's saying is, a person who has no saltiness is worse than a dead person. A Christian who has no Christ-likeness, no zeal, not just faith, but radical faith, He's saying that person is worthless to the kingdom of God. Absolutely worthless. You know, most people say it back to the text in Acts chapter 4, things like, before I really go all out, before I sell all out to the Lord, I mean, before I just say, I'm, I'm in, to the death, whatever it takes, I, I got to see, you know, something. I got to see something. It's not the way it happens. Faith. You see by the eyes of faith what you need to see. And the scripture says that to the one who has, that little revelation that God gives you because you believe in it, and, and he may have testified some little thing in your heart, to the one who has, more will be given. And so often we sit back and we think, no, I need the more. But you can't have it because you won't possess what you have. You won't hold what you have. You go and bury it in the ground. And nothing can happen once you do that. You say, yeah, but I'll never lose it. Right, but you're not taking a risk, which shows that there isn't any faith. And so the Lord will add nothing to it. You'll never be filled with power. What I want to talk about today, back in Acts chapter 4, and we're going to shorten things up a little bit, so we'll probably bring this in two-parter, but it's not the cost of being a spirit-filled church or a spirit-filled person, but the, the danger. And we scratched the surface of that a little bit last week. But there is a great danger in being a spirit-filled person. The church that is truly set on being filled with the Spirit and sold out for Jesus is a dangerous
dangerous church. It's not only dangerous for God, it's dangerous, it's dangerous for the people in that church. Okay? Um, verse 32, back in the text. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Now some people think that this is the model, and they have really radical ideas about um, you know, starting a church, putting everything all into one pot, and developing a commune. That's backwards. It, it was something like that. But they didn't have a guideline for structure. There wasn't a program they implemented to see this emerge. What happened was they loved God as a result. They loved each other. And as a result of that, there was this unity and benevolence, the grace of God overflowing. And they became givers. And so this just emerged. They didn't try to make this happen. This happened on its own. It was the outflow, the overflow of being a spirit-filled church. So you don't go and try to make that happen. Like, I'm not, not going to ask you next Sunday, you know, to bring, you know, all your money in your houses and everything and start, you know, signing the leases and the deeds over. That's unscriptural. And there are people who do that. God have mercy on them in the day of judgment. But that's not what this is. This is the outflow, but it's notable because have you ever seen that happen naturally? Anywhere, ever in your whole life? Have you seen it happen in a church anywhere? Just naturally it emerges, the people all of a sudden, just like this, begin to share everything that they have to the extent that everything becomes commonly possessed. I don't think you have. You may have been to a commune. My question would be, is that something they structured that an isolated few people were a part of? But in this culture, you don't very often see that. It's a testimony to a spirit-filled church. The more truly spirit-filled you are individually, the more benevolent you become, the more spirit-filled your church is, the more it loves itself and edifies itself and wants to take care of itself naturally. It can't but help do it because the Holy Spirit's the one who sheds the love of God abroad in your heart. So when a brother hurts, you hurt, you want to meet his needs. And this just emerges. So this was the state of the church. And it developed in seven and a half weeks. From nothing to this in seven minutes. That is, that's crazy. It, it, it's just crazy. Verse 33. So we get, they're filled with power. They're being rocked by the Holy Spirit. They're being used. And look at the benevolent atmosphere within the church in verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. Great power, great grace. And there's another great in this passage that we'll get to, but the word there uh, for great is the word mega. Say mega because it's fun to say it. Let's say it. Mega. Mega. Just repeat it. Mega. Mega. Right? Throw some. Did anyone watch the little old cartoon, Mega Man? It was very, it was very stupid. But mega. Mega is the word. They didn't just have power. They didn't just have grace. But they had mega power, mega grace. This was a mega church, but not in the sense that churches are mega churches today. What makes a mega church are three things we'll see today. Mega power. Mega grace, not mega people, not mega money. He said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Mega power, mega grace, sharing things in common. Not big church, but nobody cares about poor guy or he's just a project. Mega power, mega grace. 
increase. It's an amazing scenario. And you see the outflow again of what a mega grace looks like. You've seen mega power, healing, earthquake, rushing mighty wind. But now mega grace. Verse 34, nor was there any among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses. So it does, it says all. Nobody made them do it. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Genuine need. Now, hey, Peter, what's up, man? House needs a paint job, brother. <laughs> the, the, the car, bro, is just, you know, that thing, you know, help me out, bro. That's, that's not the scenario. Has anyone had need? Need, need. Verse 35, they laid them at the apostles' feet and distributed them as anyone had need. You know what also here is amazing? They weren't getting manipulated. See, usually when mega grace is not in place and you don't have this overflow of benevolence, not only is the benevolence not there, but what is there? Half of it's just going to, to people that don't have real needs. Well, there are needs to them, of course, because in our minds, we need this, we need that. I mean, you don't need much at all. Amen. According to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, if you seek the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, he'll supply all these things. And if you want to go back in there and check out what these things are, there ain't no new paint jobs and things like that. Those things are nice, but it comes down to things like food and shelter and clothing. Needs. Needs. Okay? And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles. These guys are renaming people. Not everybody. But something about this guy just, they felt like, man, Joseph doesn't fit. Barnabas. Which is translated son of encouragement. This guy is an encouragement to them. This guy fills them with a sense of, man, God is so good. Do you see this guy? Peter, John, did you guys hear about what uh, Joseph did? Yeah, we're calling him Barnabas now. Well, what did he do? Well, um, having, he was a, a Levite from Cyprus, and having sold his, his land, he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so Joseph, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, translated some of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having sold it, a land that he had, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And they're tripping on this. They're feeling uh, bolstered. And, and just like God has used this man's benevolence to bless them, to bless the church, and it's just flooring them because it's not normal. It's, this isn't natural. Give me uh, the leftovers. That's natural if I'm the needy person. Uh, bring the stuff that don't work right no more to the church garage sale. Don't, I'm not talking about our DC sales. So don't, but that's natural. I mean, it really is natural. You know? Give me, you know, you got a new one. Give me your old one. That's natural. But not this. Cyprus, you know, one of the Grecian islands. Hey, I got a pad out on, you know, the island, Cyprus. And, uh, yeah, I don't need it anymore because I've decided I'm just going to come to Jerusalem and hang out here. You know, I get a little house down the street or something. But, anyway, I sold the multi-million dollar pad out on the island. Here, here it is. I'll take the little thing. Why? Because he's seeing something mega. And he knows he cannot have it if he's got something mega worldly. If you have mega worldly inside your heart, you can't have mega power. You can't. You can have fake power. You can have little power, but you can't have mega power. If you have mega worldly in your heart, in the sense that it's not just that you're rich, but riches have you, is what I'm talking about. You can't have mega grace. Can't have 
grace to have your own grace. I mean, grace is grace, but the manifestation of it, what you experience of it, I'm saying you, you won't experience very much. This guy is so encouraging because, man, he's an example. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also, being aware of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last, and so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. That was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, How is it that you've agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last and the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Last verse. So great fear. Great fear. Also verse 5. Great fear came upon all the church. Came upon all the church. And upon all who heard these Things. Mega fear. Mega fear. Now we're not going to go too deeply today because we, you know, purposely um, went longer in worship, and I think that was probably more valuable than anything that I could say here, except for what the Lord may speak directly to you through this. We're going to cover this large concept of what it means to have mega fear. An awesome revere of God. An awesome reverence of God. It means that through this, they saw God as holy. All over again, for some maybe who didn't even know what that meant, now they knew what it meant. They saw God as holy. How many of you have read the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Put them together, set in another place. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. Okay? But it came upon the church. Why? Because God killed somebody in the church. <gasps> what did you say? God? Yeah, they lied to God. They lied to the same Holy Spirit that was filling the church, the spirit that was present and that was giving power and grace that was active and alive in a big way in their midst, up close and personal, these guys decided, I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to resist you. It's like in Joshua's day when he comes out of the box, mighty warrior, crushing it for the Lord on his way into the promised land. The power of God on him, crushing foreign armies. And then he's defeated at I. Because sin is in the camp. See, here's the reality. Satan's been attacking from the outside. But now the tactic changed. Now, from within. And he would do that in the days of Joshua with Achan, who would take garments and goods that were off limits from the army that the Israelites defeated. He would hide them in his tent and he would bring a reproach. He would bring God's judgment upon Israel. And so it was necessary that he die. 
See, that's, you're talking crazy talk, bro. No, no, it's, I'm just telling you what's here. Yep, here they are. They showed up at church, and then, you know, some dudes dragged this guy out of the church dead. You know, so like next Sunday morning, I mean, we probably all go to jail for it, but that, you know, would make news probably pretty quick. Like, hey, this church is killing people. People go, show up, and not only that, but it doesn't happen until they give the offering. They give the offering, then they drop dead. These guys drag them out. It's like one of those Southern Baptist churches with a graveyard in the back or something here. They're buried. The wife doesn't even know it. It happens with her. She just shows up and kind of gloating. And why? Because they're envious of Barnabas. They want to be like Barnabas. You can't have both. You can't have mega affluence and also mega grace. You can't have both. Amen. You can't have the power of God and also have the power and the riches of this world eating you alive inside so that you're lying to the Holy Spirit, living a deceitful life, lying to God. You can't have both. You have to repent if that is in you. You have to, you have to repent. You can't have both. And, and they want it. They want it. And James says that that kind of wisdom where bitter envy and strife are. He says, this wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. It's demonic. And, and people struggle with this, I know, because God killing people. Come on. Uh, he changed. You know, that was the Old Testament God. You know, he, he, he's still holy. Amen. Read Hebrews right. chapter 12. Our God is a consuming fire. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it says that it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. That's what it says. Now, Peter was talking about an era. Not back then in 68 AD, but an era. This one. This is the era of the church of God being refined. You say, well, I haven't experienced that. I don't see it yet. We're so comfortable. Wait, you will. Amen. You will. Yeah, but killing people. I mean, come on, killing. First Corinthians chapter ten. Many are sick and many sleep among you because you disregarded the body and blood of the Lord. First Corinthians ten. Paul says, all these things happen to them to serve as examples for you, upon whom the end of the ages has come. We're going to look at one last little passage together. We're going to close out, save the greater part of this discussion. For next Sunday. Revelation chapter 3. If you're not willing to see the Jesus that gives the Holy Spirit in this powerful way as He is, there's a blockage. There's a hindrance. That will serve in as, as an obstacle to you being filled in this powerful way with power and grace and awe, fear of God. Jesus is a king. He's a lord. He's a master. Revelation chapter 3, I just want to read some words from him to you. Verse 18, he's talking to the church of Thyatira. Let um, me back that up a little bit. Actually, uh, chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. That, that's how he looks at the church, with absolute passion and zeal. Because he loves us with a jealous love, a godly jealousy, but a jealous love nevertheless. And so he looks at us with these eyes of fire as he does the church of Thyatira. And he says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. As far as your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. 
Now listen carefully. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed. You can't change the language. He says, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death and children meaning those she's produced with her falsehood and liberalism. Those who followed her, believed her, and become like her and disregarded the holiness of God. And all the churches, not the world, all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give each one of you according to your words. Each one of you according to your works. If we could just come and we want to do one closing song. Um, I want to leave you with this because we're going to pause it until next week. But do you, do you really want to experience a move of God individually and as a church? How many could, could just say, I really do. I really do. Raise your hand if that's you. I just want to get it. Most of you do. The Word of God, right? Sharp than any two-edged sword. Two-edged sword. It works both ways. The last thing I want to say to you. The sword that you and I bears from the Lord, the sword that we raise to conquer with in the name of Jesus, it will never be any more effective than the sword with which we have been conquered. Look at your life. Has the Word of God conquered you? Does He rule you? Are you under its power? Because that's the back edge of that double-edged sword. And that front edge will be no sharper for you than the back edge has been in your own life. You and I, brothers and sisters, we can't expect the Word of God that comes from our lips in our lives to bring conviction into someone else if it's not bringing conviction into us. You can't expect the words that come from your lips to know the heart of another person if it doesn't know your heart. And the one thing that I know from the scriptures that can get into that, get us to that place, is renewing our sense of the fear of God. And that only happens when we say, Lord, I've counted the cost. I realize it's all or nothing. And there's things that, like you and I, I'm holding back. I'm lying to you about these things. It's not me that I've lied to, it's you, Lord. I pretend to be someone who's all in. But Lord, you know the truth. Listen, you give that piece up that you've held back, it might kill you if you don't. But you give that up.